so good to be in the house with you today. I'll give explanation to our Guns N' Roses intro here in just a moment. But before I do, I just want to take a minute and I just want to give some honor uh, to a guy by the name of Jeff White. And Jeff is such a faithful, uh, fruitful multiplier of God's kingdom in this house. When I think about this message uh, that we're going to preach, I couldn't help but think about how Jeff White exemplifies this. And some of you may not know Jeff, but you know him, whether you know him or don't know him, because he serves, he gives, he loves, he does everything anyone could ever ask. So know that we value you more than words could ever express, and we're so honored to have you a part of this house. Jeff, can we give it up for him? Man, if you're joining us online, we say welcome in the room. My name is Jacob. So good to have you with us. We're kicking off this brand new series called Guns and Roses. And some of you came in and you just heard that and you got just a little bit uncomfortable. So let me give you a little bit of a backdrop as to where this came about. My middle child, Ava, she's my music buff. And when she and I are in the car alone, some of you have heard me tell the stories that she always asked to listen to songs that I liked when I was a kid. So we listened to a lot of George Strait and Brooks and Dunn, and we listened to Guns and Roses. And we listened to Sweet Child of Mine. It's a song that we play repeatedly. And she refers to it as the pizza parlor song because when I was a kid growing up, Sweet Child of Mine played on the jukebox at pizza parlor. In fact, if you grew up like I grew up, the only time you were allowed to listen to Guns N' Roses was if it played on the jukebox at Pizza Parlor. Otherwise, you might get a one-way ticket to you know where. And so I always loved the song, and so we listened to it, and I'm with my little girl. We're playing the song, and I'm looking at her, and I'm just thinking, like, man, like, she really is a sweet child of mine. What a gift she is. And I started thinking about how God looks down at each and every one of us, his creation, his sons, his daughters, and he thinks sweet child of mine. And so that was the original message idea, and then I started thinking about other Guns N' Roses songs, and I realized... I mean, this is a kingdom versus culture series if there's ever been one. So today we're going to talk about Welcome to the Jungle and how this world is our jungle. God didn't create you and I to live in the chaos, the sin, the confusion that we live in. God actually intended for us to live in perfect unity with him and sin entered the world. And so now this world is our jungle. Next week we'll talk about Sweet Child of Mine, our identity in Christ. It's actually the message I'm most excited about, so make sure that you're back because we're going to talk about how our, our identity determines the decision decisions that we make in a kingdom versus culture fight. Week three, we're going to talk about knocking on heaven's door and how Christ doesn't save us just for eternity. He saves us so that our lives will be transformed in how we live today so that kingdom can come through our lives. And then the last week, we're going to talk about the song Patience and how the world has sold us this instantaneous timing. But God's timing is what's actually divine and is what we should actually pursue in our lives. So guns and roses, kingdom versus culture, here we go. Welcome to the jungle. Have you ever gotten out of your car and you left it in drive? You ever made that mistake? See, I would love to say that I never have, and I would love to say that I've only made the mistake once, but the truth is I live a rushed life most of the time, and so I've made this mistake more than once where my mind is 8,742 places. I pull up, I get out of the car, and the car is still in drive. Now, if you've ever made this mistake, what you know is that when you get out of the car, if it's still in drive, it keeps moving. When it's in drive, there's a momentum to what is happening. See, you and I, each and every one of us, we have a choice to make. Are we going to allow kingdom to be in drive in our life, the principles of God's kingdom, his truth, his word, his faithfulness, his fruitfulness, or are we going to allow culture to drive our lives? Now, the enemy has gotten so good at what he does that he has sold a lie that far too many of us have bought because there's a second car scenario I want you to think about. Any of you ever drove an old jalopy that broke down? I'm not talking about this like, you know, like my car broke down one time and roadside assistance came. I'm talking old school, wore out, not sure if it's going to get you to point A to point B, no cell phone, got to decide if you're going to walk or push it, car breakdown. Y'all soft. Y'all live bougie lives. You know what I'm saying? You're like, I thought you just called your dad when that happened, Right? When your car breaks down, for those of you, because clearly many of you have not experienced this, so I'm going to give you a life lesson. Sometimes you have to push it. 
like Fred Flintstone. <laughs> now, if you have to push your car, it's important that you put it in neutral. If it's in neutral, you have the ability to move a vehicle. Now, we've bought the lie that culture is neutral. Eh, yeah, it kind of tries to influence me or push me or have its way. Like, ah, yeah, culture's kind of neutral, but it's not really something that I have to be worried about. No, culture wants to drive your life and influence every single thing. Culture wants to influence your finances, your serving, your marriage, your relationships, your dating life, your sexuality. Culture wants to influence your outlook on the world. Culture wants to drive and control your life. Welcome to the jungle. But you and I have this incredible choice that we can make. And we can make the choice that kingdom is going to drive our lives, not culture. It's a choice that each and every one of us has to actually make because culture is not neutral. How do we know this? Look in John 10 and 10 with me. It says this, the thief, the enemy, Satan, comes only. It's a really important word. Only. Singular purpose. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The enemy's sole objective in your life is to steal, kill, and destroy. That doesn't sound very neutral to me. Steal, kill, and destroy sounds like a very offensive-minded enemy. It sounds like an enemy that wants to drive and control and influence and have his way in my life. But Jesus says this, I have come that they, you and me, may have life and have it to the fullest. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus comes that we may have life and have it to the fullest. Welcome to the jungle. Culture is coming for you. It's like lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. We see this great illustration in Romans 5, 12. Through 17, Paul's writing a church, a letter to the church in Rome, and he says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. I just want to pause here so that we can break this down. What Paul is saying to the church in Rome, and he's saying to you and I, is that sin came to the world through one man, Adam. When God created Adam, he placed him in the garden in perfect unity with the Father. And he gave Adam one simple rule. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. One rule. Everything else was fair game in Adam's life. And Adam broke the one single rule. So all sin came into the world through Adam. And when sin entered the world, death came about because death is the justified, rightful consequence of sin. And in this way, death came to all of us because we are all sinners. We have all sinned. Paul goes on to say this. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. There's a period between Adam being created by God at the very beginning of time as we know it, and a guy named Moses coming into existence, and Moses receives the law, this set of rules from God. So between that time, Paul saying, yeah, yeah, sin was still in the world even before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death, the consequence of sin, reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam who is a pattern of the one to come. It's a pretty grim outlook on life, right? Like Adam sinned, centered the world. Death is the consequence of sin. We've all sinned. Therefore, death is the consequence for all of us. Now for the good news. Welcome to the jungle. But the gift is not like the trespass. The gift that God has for you and me is not like the sin. For if the many died by the trespass, by the sin of the one man, how much more did God's grace 
and the gift that came by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. So sin enters the world through one man, Adam, and it affects all of us. Grace enters the world through one man, Jesus Christ, and affects all of us. It says, nor can the gift of God be compared to the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift of Jesus Christ and his grace followed many sins and brought justification, meaning it, the grace of Jesus puts us back in right standing with God the Father. For if by the sin of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ? It's a really complicated way of Paul saying this. There's only two options, kingdom or culture. There's only two options, sin or grace. There's only two options, death or life. Now, when we think about it in this context, and, and, and I put it to you like that, and you're like, okay, so culture brings sin, and sin brings death, but the kingdom brings Jesus, and bre Jesus brings grace and life. We're all like, yeah, give, give me the kingdom, right? Give me the Jesus way. That seems like a way better way. So why do we struggle to allow kingdom to drive our life so bad when it seems so clear. I want life over death. I want grace over sin. I want Jesus over the enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy my life. Why do we struggle so difficult? I believe that we in American culture, which I love and I value, so don't take this as a slide on that. I believe that we in American culture really struggle because we live in a republic. Our voice matters through our vote. We at least think that we have some influence over our leaders. But in a kingdom, the king is sovereign. In America, we have convinced ourselves that our opinion matters. In a kingdom, the only opinion that matters is that of the king. We struggle with that concept, right? Like, hold on. My opinion doesn't matter. What I think doesn't matter. No. Amen. Not in God's kingdom. Welcome to the jungle. Kingdom or culture. This is something that we wrestle with, right? Like you hear this and you're like, hold on. Surely my opinion does matter though, right? No. It doesn't. Not in the kingdom of God. His word is truth. It's final. It's authoritative. It's everlasting. It's infallible. Like, this is it. If you're going to clap, clap, right? It's kingdom or it's culture. Paul's like, hey, dude, there's just two choices. Culture brings sin. Sin brings death. That's the way of Adam. Or you can take the way of Jesus. And what Jesus does is he brings grace and truth and life. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give you life and give it to you in the fullest. And we're like, yeah, 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 I want that. And then we're like, wait, what I think doesn't matter? And we aren't sure that we're okay with that. Culture tells us that we have a voice. We have a platform. But in a kingdom, the voice of the king is the voice that matters. And we have a really natural issue with authority, and I get it because I struggle with it too, and I want to be abundantly clear. When I talk about authority, I'm not talking about mine or man's. I'm talking about God's authority and his authority alone. And we still struggle, but we see this illustration of a truth that understanding God's authority unlocks potential in our lives in Luke chapter 7. It's the story of a centurion soldier, and we learned last week that a centurion soldier is a man under authority and a man with authority. That a centurion soldier serves under some people, and there are people that serve under the centurion soldier. And we see in this passage, it says, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking Jesus to come and heal his servant. 
When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with Jesus, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. Jesus was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to Jesus saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. The centurion's already expressing his understanding of the authority of the king, Jesus. He's like, Jesus, no, 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 like, you don't need to actually come to my house. I sent some Jewish leaders because I understand I'm a Roman Gentile, and I don't really need to be asking you for favors, so I sent some people that you could connect with to ask, and like, I heard you're now coming, and you don't need to come because, like, you're a man of authority, and I don't deserve to have you under my roof in this moment. That is why I don't even consider myself worthy to come to you. Then notice this. The centurion says, but Jesus, just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. Everybody say authority. I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at the centurion and turning to the crowd following him, Jesus said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Okay, what causes Jesus to stop and go like, I haven't found such great faith? even in Israel, even where God's people should be and they should understand me and what's going on. What was it? It was the centurion's recognition of the authority of the king. The centurion says, think about it. He's like, hey, Jesus, you don't need to come here. I understand how authority works. You're a man of authority. I am under authority. I do what the uppers tell me to do. I have people under me and they do what I tell them to do. So I know that you, Jesus, when you simply open your mouth, you have the authority to change the well-being being of my servant. The centurion soldier is recognizing the authority and because he's recognizing the authority of King Jesus, it is unlocking potential in his life that he otherwise would not have access to. See, when you submit to God's authority, you get covered by God's anointing. When you submit to God's authority, you unlock God's power and provision and covering over your life. It's kingdom or it's culture. There's just two choices. Requires submission to the authority of King Jesus in this moment. And this is still really hard for us though, right? You're like, hold on. Can we go back to whether or not my opinion matters? In the kingdom of God. Because, listen, I want my opinion to matter too. I'm like, God, man, there's a better way, right? I feel like I'm on Shark Tank sometimes when I pray to him. Like, I'm serious, man. Got to be a better way. But it's a recognition of authority that moves Jesus. And it's so difficult for us when we think about it in this way. But here's what's wild. We submit to culture's authority over and over and over and over and over. See, when we make decisions out of pressure, we submitted to culture's authority. When we make decisions out of wondering what people will think of us, we just made, submitted ourselves to culture's authority. And listen, next week we're going to talk at length about our identity in Christ and how it impacts our decisions. And you need to be here for it because we've got to understand that there's a direct correlation between our identity and our decisions. So we say like, oh, I don't, man, that authority, that, that lordship of Jesus, that's scary stuff. Yet we submit to culture's authority over and over and over. So why not kingdom authority? Because I want you to understand this. Kingdom authority is good authority. Kingdom authority is authority that's for you, that's with you. What did John 10, 10 tell us? The enemy comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus Christ came to give life and to give it to the fullest, to give it in abundance. It's good authority. If you're in the room and you're like, I'm going to say, I'm going to say you need to be like 28, 28 and older, 28 and older, okay? If you're younger than 28, you're going to understand this when you turn 28. 
But if you're 28 or older, which, which, what you realize is you have this moment in your life where, where you wake up and you realize that all of the things that your mom and dad or those in authority over you told you to do that you thought was so dumb and so stupid and so meaningless and so worthless, all of it was for your good. Yeah. And then here's when it really comes to life for you. When you have kids of your own, and you begin to realize that making your kids do the right thing is much more difficult than just allowing them to be snot-faced little demons. <laughs> like actually raising your kids to be productive, fruitful, faithful citizens of the kingdom of God is much harder than just allowing them to be worthless. Then all of a sudden you feel like this centurion and you're like, no, Jesus, I served under some good authority I see that now, and I have some authority over somebody, and I recognize that there is such a thing as genuine, altruistic, thoughtful, selfless authority that can exist, and it's found in the kingdom of God. Kingdom authority is good authority, for you authority. It's so good that it sent Jesus Christ to die for your sins. We should desire to submit to kingdom authority in our life. I want you to see how good the kingdom of God really is. In Matthew 13 and verse 44, we see three parables illustrated by Jesus. The first one says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. You got to understand, this guy finds this treasure. You're like, what is treasure doing in a field? You gotta have some historical context. See, there were people that would loan you money at the time that Jesus is sharing this parable, but there weren't banks. You didn't have deposit accounts. You couldn't go up and say, deposit that check for me. Give me a safety deposit box. So what people would do is they would bury their treasure, their money, their valuable things. It was the way that they kept it safe. So this guy goes on this piece of land and he's like, holy smokes, there's a lot of really valuable treasure here. You're like, why didn't he just take it? He didn't take it because he was submitted to authority. And the authority of the law of the day said that you're not allowed to take the treasure, even if you found it, unless you own the ground. So in all of his joy and exuberance, what does he do? He goes and sells everything that he has so that he can buy this piece of ground so that he can receive the treasure that he found and make it his own. I want you to see how good the kingdom of God really is. Jesus left it all when he stepped down from heaven to buy it all through his bloodshed to have us all enter his kingdom. The kingdom of God is good authority. You and I, we are the treasure in the field of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus left it all to buy it all, to have us all. And when you recognize how good the authority of the kingdom of heaven really is, you want to put kingdom in drive in your life. Welcome to the jungle. His kingdom or its culture. And then here's what happens. When you recognize that you're the treasure in the field, Jesus becomes your treasure. And when Jesus becomes your treasure, he becomes your king. And when Jesus becomes your king, you will joyfully sell all that you have to follow him, to be in his presence, to be his hands and feet, to serve under the authority of the king. The kingdom is so valuable that I'll give up anything of this culture to gain the kingdom of heaven. Second parable, pick it up in verse 45. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one, everybody say one. It's important. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. What is Jesus saying? There's only one kingdom that matters. It's his. Just one. There's one kingdom valuable enough to sell everything you have to follow it. It's God's kingdom. Then in verse 47, we see the third parable. It says, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down in the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad fish away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. 
The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Welcome to the jungle, right? I mean, Jesus got pretty heavy with everybody right there. He dropped it on them. But when you don't understand this, just as God gave Adam a choice, kingdom or culture, he gives each and every one of us a choice, kingdom or culture. We can choose the king and we can find life and find it to the fullest or we can choose culture and we can succumb to the enemy that wants to steal, kill and destroy. The kingdom of heaven is available to each and every one of us. So when Jesus is like, hey, there's going to be a day of separation, I don't want that to terrify you. I want to encourage you to make the choice to allow kingdom to drive your life. See, our vision here at this church, our vision statement is to see kingdom come through your life. We want to see kingdom come through your life, not just this church, not just this staff, not just the lead team. We want to see kingdom come through the life of each and every single individual in this room. We desire to see the kingdom of God in driving your life. Jesus behind the steering wheel of your life. Why? Because we know that the kingdom is available to all of you. Each and every one of us can see kingdom come through our life. See, God wants to be involved. God wants to be involved in your business, your dating, your marriage, your finances, your hopes, your dreams, your frustrations and failures. God wants to be involved in all of it, every aspect of your life. He wants you to choose kingdom. God wants to do life with you. He wants his kingdom to be done and his will to be done in your life and on this earth through you. We're in a jungle. I get it. Welcome to the jungle. But we have a choice to see kingdom come through our life. Blows my mind that God wants to partner with us. But he does. And it makes sense when you think about it in kingdom principles. Because a king places people to be his voice to do his work. A king would have a kingdom to reign and rule over so he would give people a little bit of authority and send them to a place to be his voice to do his work. And a really good king would equip his people. And we serve a really good king that equips us. Check this out in Luke chapter 12, verse 29. It says, and do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. See, at this point in time, there, there's like a question about if you would eat, what you would eat, how that would go. We can easily skim over this and forget that first century Palestine's like broke and poor and rough and ragged. This isn't glamorous life like you and I live. He's saying, listen, don't set your heart on what you will eat. Do not worry about it. Don't worry. Worry's a really small, big word. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. Your father knows you need to eat. He knows you need something to drink. Instead of worrying, what are we to do? Seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Then he says this. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Your father's been pleased to give you the kingdom. It was a while back, and my kids were asking me, like, what's your greatest fear? They're all talking about their greatest fears, you know, spiders and snakes and, you know, tornadoes and things that you would think people would be afraid of. And they're asking me about my greatest fears. And I started really processing that because that's a, that's a scary thing to think about at 37 years of age. You're like, oh, man, what is my greatest fear? And I came to this realization that my greatest fear is that God isn't good or that he wouldn't be good to me. I think if you just pause for a moment and really reflect it on your spiritual journey, I think most of you will connect with it. The fear that maybe God, maybe he's not good. Or maybe God is good, but that wondering if God is going to be good to you. Like, does he really care about me, like where I am? You want to know the truth? Like, I'm a nightmare to live with the week after resurrection Sunday. A nightmare. 
Guys, we smashed attendance records here. We had more than 20 confirmed salvations, more than 200 people served in this house. Like every reason to celebrate. Yeah. And I go home and I have to fight it because my natural tendency is to worry and fret and like we all these, these people and are they gonna come back and were we nice enough? Did I preach well enough? Like where our transition's gonna, did we not speak to somebody? Are they gonna be angry? The people that just came to know Jesus, how do we turn them into disciples? Is that what we're called to do? And we don't have enough seats and we don't have enough room. Where are we gonna go and how's this gonna work? And God, are you really gonna be good to me? You ever feel that way in your life? Like God, are you really going to be good to me? Like, I need you in this moment, and I need you now, and I need you to show up and have your way. And he says, don't worry about it. Seek my kingdom. Don't worry about it. Seek my kingdom in your life. And I want you to see why we can say with great confidence that God is good to all of us. He said this, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Jesus is quashing our fear that God may not be good or he may not be good to us because the king refers to himself not as a king but as a father. The king refers to himself in the passages, references his kingdom as a dad that wants to embrace and love and open his arms. The king himself diminishes his title, seemingly so, by culture standards and doesn't say, no, 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 I'm the king, I'm Lord, listen and obey. He says, no, I'm I'm your father and I want to give you the kingdom. I have life and life to the fullest for you. Choose the kingdom and you'll find something meaningful and rich. Charles Spurgeon put it like this so beautifully. He said, instead of being anxious, seek first God's kingdom. In other words, when you think about your life or your food or your clothes or your spouse or your job or your mission, don't fret. Instead, make God the king in that affair and in that moment and hand over the situation to his kingly power and do his righteous will with the confidence that he will work for you and meet all your needs. To seek the kingship of God first in every affair and every moment of life is a thrilling way to live. It's full of freedom and peace and joy and adventure and hardship but it's all worth it. If you believe in the kingship of your heavenly father, you do not need to be anxious about anything. In Matthew 25 and 34, they double down on this concept. It says, come, oh, blessed of my father, inherit. That's a really important word because inheritance comes through familial lineage. Inherit the kingdom that the father prepared for you from the foundation of the world so how right like how do we choose kingdom over culture how do we really do that it's kind of like walmart substitutions you ever do walmart pickup walmart delivery can i get an amen Amen. thank you jesus it's a gift from the father above i will inherit thy kingdom You know, most of the time they get the substitutions pretty right. You're like, yeah, that made sense. They were out of that. They gave me that. That makes sense. But every once in a while, you'll get that substitution that you think, those two things couldn't be more different, Walmart guy. What were you thinking? See, listen, we just need to set the record real straight right now. Cool Ranch Doritos are not a substitution for nacho cheese. It's like saying Nemo and shark are the same thing, right? Both fish, not the same. Both chips, not the same. It's like every once in a while you get this really divergent substitution and you're like, man. See, this is how we choose the kingdom of God in our life though. We make these divergent substitutions. We choose kingdom over culture. Let me illustrate it. When we speak life instead of gossip, that's kingdom over culture. When we worship rather than worry, that's kingdom over culture. 
when we pray rather than scroll through social media, that's kingdom over culture. When we serve over selfishness, that's kingdom over culture. When we choose life over sin, that's kingdom over culture. When you substitute the things of the world for the things of God, you're putting kingdom in drive in your life. If you get out of the car and it's still in drive, the car keeps moving. Can I tell you the same thing happens when you put kingdom in drive in your life? You no longer have to be behind the wheel for the car to keep advancing, for the kingdom to keep moving, for the mission to keep multiplying in your life. When we put kingdom in drive in our life, Jesus gets behind the wheel and all of a sudden we're going to places we didn't even know we could get. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus Christ came to give life and to give it to the absolute fullest so that you and I could walk in the power, the might, the authority, and the value of the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. So as we wrap this all the way up, I just want to ask you just so sincerely, which is in drive in your life, kingdom or culture? And maybe it's a mixed bag, right? You're like, I got kingdom in some areas, but man, I got culture in some areas. Remember, culture isn't neutral. Culture wants to influence and wants to erode and wants to take control of your life. So if there's any area in your life where you don't have kingdom and drive, can I challenge you today, make it a priority this week to ensure that you're substituting the things of culture for the things of kingdom in that area of your life. Maybe it's in your parenting. Maybe you're like me, it's hard to be patient all the time. You think, golly, can't you just for once do the right thing? Wouldn't it be swell? Someone told me in the lobby after first service, they said, you know, did you ever think that God's children don't do the right thing, so maybe we're in pretty good company when our kids act out? It's like, well, fair. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your workplace. I don't know where it is for you, but I really challenge you to search your heart, to allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate the Word of God in your life and see if there's any area where culture is reigning over kingdom and put kingdom and drive in that area of your life. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you today just so grateful and humbled by the opportunity to serve you. God, I'm so thankful for a church that values worshiping, that values recognizing your worth and your value, that values recognizing your lordship and your kingship. God, I'm so thankful that you've chosen us to be heirs of the kingdom of God. God, I pray that we take on the weight of that responsibility, not with anxious hearts and not with worry, but with dedication and commitment to seeing kingdom drive in our life. God, I pray that we understand that it is by faithfulness and consistency that your kingdom come on this earth. And God, I pray that we see kingdom come through the life of each and every individual that's in this room. We give you praise and honor. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we say it all. And everybody said a great big.